Now you'll notice what he says here again in verse 2. Thou art fairer than the children of man. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. This is a love song. And this is to be occupied with a person. Remember Paul mentioned that in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, about beholding as in a mirror the Lord Jesus. And we're changed from glory to glory. We need to behold him more. Now, we are seeing him here not as Savior, but as King. Verse 3, Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. Now, here's when he comes forward. He's coming forth here not as Savior. He's coming forth as the King in his second coming. And we need, I think, a correct perspective of Christ. Before, you'll recall, they expected a Messiah with a sword. He came without a sword. You remember, he says, put up thy sword. He said, if I needed any help, we'd have legions of angels here. He said, they that take the sword will perish with the sword. Now, today, they expect a Messiah without a sword, just bringing peace. Well, he's coming this next time. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's Psalm 2, where he's coming the second time. And that's quoted several times in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, in respect to his second coming. Now, when he returns, he's going to find the world in rebellion. Antichrist is in power and persecuting God's people, both the remnant of Israel and that great company of Gentiles that have turned to God. Now, grace is in his lips. There's also condemnation and judgment, too. But our attention is called to this. I think we ought to be realistic, not idealistic. How else will he come to power? He'll have to come to power because the wrath of the Lamb is being now displayed against a world that's in rebellion against him. And we're told here in verse 4, and let me read that, "...and in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee all inspiring things." I like that translation a little better. Now notice, he's riding to victory, and here's his platform. Truth, meekness, righteousness. These are the three planks in his platform. Do you know any candidate today that's using these three planks in his platform? They don't sound meek to me. And truth, I wonder, and righteousness, well, that's not the motive. The whole motive today is not to do right. It's to get elected. And oh, how... This poor nation of ours needs a candidate who will speak truth, who exhibits a little meekness, and who goes out for righteousness. These are eternal principles of his kingdom, and they're enduring that. No president, no leader, no dictator, no king ever comes to power on this platform in the history of this world. And that's the reason he's different. The character of Christ, he is the truth. His words are truth. And he's made a liar in this world today. But all men are liars, not Christ. And you won't hear the truth today in the halls of Congress or in the marts of trade or on Wall Street or in our industrial complexes or on our college campuses or in the newspaper, or on the TV or the radio. All news is slanted today. And you won't hear it in a great many churches. He's coming to power on truth. And he's coming to power on this matter of humility, meekness. And humility is something that we need today. It's something that someone has said, if you wish to astonish the whole world, tell the truth. And that's the way he's coming to power. And I tell you, it'll be startling too. Now we are told, thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby thy people fall under thee. This is the picture now of his coming to this earth. 